This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu for more information. On the qualities of great leadership, I think we would probably all agree that whether in politics, in religion, in the community, in business, there are several enduring qualities that pretty much define great leadership, all times, all places, all people. Having said that, there are particulars in particular times that are on top of the universals, very important. But to get back to the universals, at the top of the list, if you don't have a vision, you don't have a strategy for getting there, you don't have a way of making things happen, call it execution to use a business word here, uh, you are probably not long for a leadership role in this world, whether it's business, in the community, or in politics. Number two, you need to bring a set of, call them character qualities, to the table or to the setting that usually boil down to such enduring verities as integrity, transparency, honesty, all these adding up to whether people will trust you when they give their money to you in business or maybe their political future to you in politics. You've got to have that character foundation and you have to be able to communicate that. So your character and an ability to help people understand who you are and that those elements of integrity and honesty are there and reliability. Number three, people who are going to work for you in a company, people who are going to vote for you in an election, people who are going to join your community organization, they all do need to know, it's unequivocal, that you have respect for them. My phrase to sum that up is when you're with people publicly, over the internet, in a room, a grand gathering that might have a couple thousand people in attendance, uh, in the course of your communication with them, you do have to tell them that you know who they are, that you have great respect for their abilities and where they're coming from and the values they represent. Sum that up, here's my phrase to keep that much in mind, you have to honor the room at some point when you're with people, and I'd even strengthen that to say at every point, you need to, in passing, reference the people there, who they are, what they represent, and how good they are, because after all, leadership is a team sport. If you can't bring them in your direction, you're leading nobody, and people want to know if they're going to join your team, that you understand who they are and that you res have respect for them. Third, if first, if first is let's call it vision strategy, execution. Second is uh, having a character that is the kind of character that we need. You need ambition, you need honesty, you need these qualities. You need to be able to communicate that. Third, honor the room. So you need to communicate that unequivocally. And fourth, I think you need to have an ability to take all the above. And when you talk with people, work with people for them to understand what you stand for and to hear those messages in a way that it sticks. My phrase to sum that up, you have to be in effect a great communicator and the way I would capture that though, when you have a point of view you have to say it so it sticks. Well leadership by definition is a team sport we have a captain of a team, but we have a team, and to say the obvious here, the most important decisions you're going to make of your entire administration will be the people that you put in office who are with you and right below you. So the secretaries of the major agencies, your chief of staff, and vital to have great people in those positions, take time to make those positions uh, properly described, the people who are coming into them well prepared for them and then you are a team and so very good my point of view anyway to take time to uh, work with that group as a group of individuals but at the end of the day they're all pulling for the country and they've got to pull together so call it team building 
lots of words that pretty much sum up to the same point. But you do need to take them for, uh, let's just say, a couple days of rafting down the Colorado or whatever it might be. That's maybe a little bit far out for whoever takes the White House on January 21st. But the main point is great people. And then with them in office, you really need to pull them into your vision, your strategy, and ultimately where you're going. Uh, number two, people are going to wait to hear with great expectation, do you have a, a, a vision for where the heck we're going and how we're going to get there? Many of these ideas, obviously, in the campaign, we're going to hear them in the debates in the weeks ahead. But as you take office, now it is a time for your visions, the rubber of your vision, to meet the road. And so great team and then a powerfully communicated statement of, of obviously your working philosophy, but in particular, what is your plan for the weeks ahead? What's your vision for the months ahead? David Gergen on several occasions has said, uh, CNN prominence now, director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School at Harvard University has said, whoever takes office in January is probably taking office at one of the most critical junctures in American history, certainly over the last 50 years. I think that sounds right between the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the economy, which hopefully will be in better shape then than it is right now, the issues of health care, the issues of education, the questions of retirement funds, Social Security, will make the challenges for the incoming president as probably as big as they have been in a generation. And that's a way of saying, to make my last point on this, as you take office, great people around you, a vision and a strategy that will help take them in the right direction collectively with you along with the country, and then your readiness to make the tough judgment calls. You've got to be ready to do that. They will be ready to do that. And what I think that comes down to is a good sense for how to make a good decision. That's obvious, that, or it's obvious what ought to go into that but to be able to make that decision in a timely fashion. Some things we can let go, some things we can put off, but the country's problem is enormous. And thus, I think there'll be a premium on making good and timely decisions, whoever takes the Oval Office late January. It's a really good question because given the universals of leadership, have a vision, communicate your character, and so on, Within a given context, the demands become more specific. So at this moment in American history, understanding strategically how the Middle East operates, appreciating how people feel about the, our social security system, very, very important. And that's a way of saying, to use a little bit of a business phrasing here, uh, you do want to see a kind of strategic fit between a specific skill set that our next president has and what's going to be required once he is in that job. And thus, looking more specifically at the circumstance we face at the moment, the challenges here are enormous. And thus, you want somebody in that office who has a pretty good stomach of iron and the ability to stay focused and calm under enormous demands and stress upon you, and a person who can, because the, this, these problems are so complex, so hard to get our hands around, who can work with great, to use a phrase here, cognitive complexity, just so many moving parts to Afghanistan, to Iraq, so many complexities in our financial system that a mind that can absorb facts, trends, underlying developments, that you can absorb all that information and then to give it one more phrase that I think captures the essence of what's going to be needed. So then you can think strategically, how are we going to get from here to there? How are we going to get derailed potentially on our way from here to there? So thinking ahead, thinking strategically, very important at this particular moment in U.S. history. Well, as we think about leadership for the White House come end of January 09, 
it is, I think, extremely useful to look back on our history and not necessarily take any past president as a paragon of success, but to draw from them what they have done very well. And I think it's appropriate here to take on a case-by-case -case basis what our previous presidents in particular have helped us appreciate is important. So let's take John F. Kennedy, the inauguration address, 1961, January. He did offer this line that I think is going to be part of American memory forever. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Now we, we know that. I've asked people about what our President John F. Kennedy said ever. Can, you, can anybody in this room name anything that he said? I've asked that in China. I've asked that in Japan. I've asked that in Argentina. Everywhere in our universe, people, not Americans, born after Kennedy's death in 1963, they know that statement. They do. So John F. Kennedy was pretty good at saying it so it sticks. And thus an ability to set forward your plan for the country in these different areas in a way that people remember it is the art of saying it so it sticks. John F. Kennedy, a pretty good example. Uh, we can draw and learn from him as a great exemplar of that particular ability. Abraham Lincoln, well known now as we have all read, or many people have read, a team of rivals for the ability to take people of different instincts who were in fact rivals for the presidency when Lincoln did become president to not only appreciate what they're saying, but to bring them in to work with you. It's a good, I think, illustration of the fact that often teams of people who think differently, all of whom are pretty good, but they think differently, and sometimes competitively with you, can often be stronger than a team of people who are just like you. So a team of rivals, the phrase we tend to use these, uh, these days is we want great diversity, and I think that's right, not necessarily only demographically, of course, but we want people who've had different experiences, they have different instincts, and assuming that they're good and able to focus on the mission and not their own career, I think you want a team of rivals or a team that's diverse. From President Ronald Reagan, an ability to remember that you are in a role you're on stage. In leadership, Shakespeare had it right, all life is a stage. And in leadership, you're always on stage. And that's not just a metaphor. You literally, every time you appear with anybody, you are in the role of the president. And I think among the images that have stayed with us and will probably always be part of American memory is Ronald Reagan's ability to walk out to meet Mr. Gorbachev at the arms negotiations in Reykjavik, Iceland, to be seemingly completely at ease, a kind of master of the moment, seemed to make everybody feel comfortable. And all that, of course, looked natural. But Ronald Reagan, he was an actor. And I say that in the way that is meant to bring out the point here. Uh, all that was not left to just his natural tendencies. He was conscious that he's in a role. And when you're in a role in a leadership position, you have to act the role. And thus, from Ronald Reagan, just a reminder to our next president, uh, you're going to be on a world stage and keeping focused on, on who you are and what you stand for and keeping that out front and keeping your vision out front and reminding people of how much you have confidence in them to get the job done out front. And remaining cool and confident is the kind of demeanor we expect and we hope that the next president does bring. The president's job is probably as hard as the person who walks into that office January 09 as any job anybody has ever had, in part because we're an enormous country, in part because we're so interdependent with the world now. What we do here ramifies through the Indian economy, affects Chinese stock market pricing. And having said that and knowing that, 
I think there's going to be a premium on the ability under that world scrutiny and anxiety, if you will, to remain completely focused on why you were in that office. And by way of parallel here, I one time did a, a study of a project on the president of El Salvador who brought that civil war, that terrible civil war to an end back in 1991. Uh, he had actually been a classmate of Bill Clinton's at Georgetown. He was from El Salvador, had come to the States for his college days. Uh, Freddy Cristiani, Alfredo Cristiani is his name, he went back to El Salvador, became president at a young age, younger than Bill Clinton became president, in the middle of a truly horrendous civil war. And he said to himself, uh, I appreciate the other side does want to kill me. The FMLN, which is the name of the guerrilla group, on several occasions did try to <laughs> indeed assassinate the president extremely dangerous to be in San Salvador, the capital. But he said, I ran for office and I was elected to office for one reason, which is to bring this war to an end. And through all that, uh, including at one point the guerrilla occupation of much of San Salvador, the capital, it's as if, of, as if half of Washington was taken over by a guerrilla group, uh, he stayed unequivocally focused on bringing that war to an end. And he said in the, sort in some of the darker days, I know I'm here because I've got to get the guerrillas to come in from the cold. Today, if you're in San Salvador, half the police force, half the army are the former guerrillas that Alfredo Cristiani persuaded to put down their rifles and their, the radio that they carried, the broadcast radios that they carried on their back to come in from the cold and now the war is over. It's what it took. Uh, it, it's what was required to give the guerrillas, that is they wanted jobs, they wanted in a sense to be reintegrated into the society in a way that was fair. Main point I would say is this, Alfredo Cristiani, case in point, we can often look to history as a way to understand what we ought to do going forward. And from his history, we are reminded in the toughest of times, think Lincoln during the Civil War as well, staying unequivocally focused on why you're in office. It's not about you, it's a, it's a calling. It's almost a sacred trust that has been put into you by the people who elected you. And since the problems are not probably bigger ever than they are right now, I think this president, whoever it's going to be, I think we should have confidence because both candidates I think are going to be good at this, will stay focused on the fact that they are in office to take us to where we want to get to from where we are right now. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.